chairman of the commission and we're going to go ahead and start the uh, Salt Lake Historic Landmark Commission meeting for September 2nd. Um, the, the meeting won't have an anchor location at the city and county building because, because of based on this determination that I, Robert Hyde, as chair of the Historic Landmark Commission, hereby determined that with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, Conditions existing in Salt Lake City, including but not limited to this week's current Utah COVID-19 hospitalization numbers, and that local health officials have indicated that hospitals and intensive care units are at critical levels, that meeting at an anchor location presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who would be present. Anybody who's interested in, um, that's the end of that statement, but anyone who would like interested in attending the meeting can access the meeting uh, through YouTube uh, or Salt Lake City TV channel 17. Um, if you'd like to participate and you should go to um, send an email, you can go to historic landmarks, one word dot comments at saltlakegov.com or connect on the WebEx site that's been sent out. Um, it's on the it's on the city's website. So um, with that said, um, See if we've added anybody. We haven't added anybody. So we'd like to, at this point, uh, move to uh, uh, approve the minutes. Does anybody have any comments on the minutes from August, uh, the August 5th meeting? They all look good to me. I'd be willing to uh, put a motion forward to approve the minutes from our last meeting. That'd be great, Kent, if you would. I move that we accept the minutes from the August HLC meeting. We have a second. Second. In favor, uh, Babs? In you favor. Seconded, so you're in favor. John? Yes. Uh, uh, Kenton? Yes. And Victoria? Victoria, you have your microphone on, are you there? It says you're mute, so Victoria, if you hear us, uh, uh, Dave Richardson. Aye. So that gives us four votes of uh, the five or six of Victoria, if you're there, uh, six of us, so the minutes are, are approved. Um, I don't have any report to make to the commission at this time. Um, Mike Beal is not here yet. Still hasn't been able to get in, I guess. So we'll keep moving. Uh, is there a director's report, uh, Wayne? Michaela, anybody have a report from the? I don't. <clears throat> I don't have too much to report other than Carlton Getz. Um, will be going in front of city council next Tuesday for a possible appointment to the historic landmark commission. And I anticipate that we'll have a couple other individuals um, soon being, um, being suggested by the mayor and interviewed by the council. So. That's great. Yes. Michaela Kenton here. Are we, are we losing? Anybody like uh, Mr. Richardson? Um, he soon, is staying on and yeah, he will be leaving soon. Victoria will be leaving soon as well. Um, but we have to have a minimum and conduct business. So until those appointments get confirmed, that they agree to stay on so that we can conduct business. Good. That would be optimal. So. That would be optimal. Thank so you, David. 15 years, Ms. David, that would be great. <laughs> Thanks okay. for the vote of approval there, Kenton. <laughs> um, so, uh, Michaela is, is, uh, Is a council that's going to come to our commission meetings, is that changed permanently now? For now? Or is it? Uh, 
You're on mute. You're on mute, Michaela. Thank you. Hannah, I'm not sure if that's an official decision that you'll be our land use attorney. So um, Paul Nielsen is still assigned to the planning department, so it will be one of us at each okay. meeting. Okay. So right. just additional resources were dedicated to the planning department. All still around. All right. Well, great. It's nice to know you're here tonight, Hannah. Thank you. Um, yep. So the first item of business we have, um, is there anybody uh, here for public comment uh, before we get into the agenda? I'm not seeing any hands up. I don't, I don't see any either. Okay. Okay, our first matter of business is an extension request. Uh, uh, Paul Garbett, you're here, I guess. So is, do we, would we have uh, anyone from staff? Is Lex gonna address this first or is this just something where it's an extension request that we go directly to the applicant? You, you can go directly to the applicant. It's basically just to give a little bit of background, the HLC approved <clears throat> this request was for new construction and a few special exceptions back in October uh, 2020 special exceptions and the uh, certificate of appropriateness for new construction. They're valid for a year unless a building permit is issued. Um, the uh, applicant is requesting an extension due to some complexities with the project. Um, most projects now a uh, shortage of labor and and materials as well as some design issues. But the uh, the applicant is here to address the commission if needed. OK. Paul, we were expecting this to be up and on the market by now and, and with, uh, <laughs> filled up with occupants. Um, yeah, so so was I. <laughs> um, I'm just joking with you. Go ahead and tell yeah. us what's happened. Yeah, no, just, you know, kind of like Wayne said, um, everything just seems to be taking longer, um, just dealing with a lot of challenges. Uh, maybe just a quick update on where we are at with the project. Um, we're hoping uh, we're in our last um, kind of phase of final comments on our final plat. So we are very close to getting that approved. Um, so far, we're just waiting on some comments back from the public <coughs> city attorney office. Um, but it seems like we have everything resolved in all the other departments. So we are getting very close. So do you have building permits yet? Or is that still what you're waiting on to? No, um, we're just, we're trying to get the final plat approval. And I suspect that we'll have that here in the next two, three weeks. So we are definitely very close. Is anybody on, this, on the uh, commission object to extending this, uh, this uh, uh, to give a one year extension on this project? If not, we'll go ahead and take a motion on this, on the extension. Does anyone want to make a motion? Babs is gone, but she's muted. <laughs> well, I'll make a motion that we, I make a wait, motion wait, that we wait, approve. Point of order. Don't we have to have public comments or did we already do that? I don't think so. No, public hearing isn't required for an extension. OK, Sorry. great. Easy peasy. Go ahead, Ken. Okay, I, I move that we approve the one year extension for, uh, um, I mean, don't have that number in front of me. The case, the case numbers are 2019-01157 uh, and 2019 Very good, yes. Uh, I move that we approve the request for an extension for PLNHLC 2019-01157 and 0158 Bishop Place. We have a second. I'll second that motion. Thank you, Aiden. Um, all in favor, I'm gonna go down the list. Babs? Aye. Uh, John? Aye. Aiden? Aye. Kenton? Aye. Victoria? Aye. 
And uh, David. Aye. Is Michael here yet? Okay, then that's unanimously approved and uh, good luck, uh, Paul. Thank you, appreciate it. But I guess now is when we would hear public comments. We've already, already raised that matter before the extension. So the first matter we have under public hearings now, we'll go into that part of our program, is the minor alteration at uh, 1024 uh, uh, First, First Avenue. Um, from the staff, Chrissy, uh, Chrissy's here. Was she, Chrissy? We'll turn the time over to you. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm not, Michaela. I'm not sure if you were going to jump in, but I, I could certainly um, do that and jump in at this point. Uh, the oh, I'm sorry. The applicant for this project has uh, had an emergency situation come up and is unable to attend the meeting tonight. Um, the applicant has asked that this item be postponed um, until the next meeting. Um, due to the, it, it, this would happen right before this meeting, so it we're unable to amend the agenda at that point of time. So uh, the agenda still stands. So a couple of things that the commission um, could do is one, just go ahead and postpone that um, item until the next month. Uh, the other option would be to go ahead and open the public hearing. Um, so if anybody's here to, that, that wants to speak and you would like to hear from them at this meeting, uh, you could certainly do that. And then we would recommend to staff that you um, then postpone it and keep the public hearing open in case somebody wants to speak to it at the next meeting. Um, so those are a couple of options for you. Well, let's go ahead and ask if there's anybody here um, that came tonight prepared to speak from the public on this matter. I don't see any hands raised. Yeah, I don't either. No emails have come through. In that Could case, we'll just we'll just postpone that. We won't open it to public here. We'll just postpone the matter until next month. Is that, uh, can I get a motion on that from the commission? You have to include the case number. So I just say I move to postpone PLN HLC 2021-00605 until the October meeting. Is that enough? Thank you, Thank you Victoria. Do we have a second on that motion? Uh, Richardson will second. However, I would like to um, make the observation that a similar case, 209 A Street, came up several years ago uh, where an am amicable um, uh, compromise was met. And uh, perhaps staff can have a look at that in the interim. So, second. <laughs> Thank you. Um, those in favor, Babs? Aye. Aye. John? Aye. Uh, Aiden? Aye. Kenton? Aye. Victoria? Aye. Uh, and David? Aye. One of these days we're going to have someone that makes a motion that uh, votes against their own motion, but I haven't seen that happen yet. So <laughs> glad that was unanimously approved and uh, we'll hope to see them next month and hope everything's okay. Uh, we're going to jump down uh, item two on our agenda had already been postponed. We're going to jump to number three, major alteration on a rear addition at 235 South 6th East. And um, Sarah, uh, are you here? Sarah, we'll turn this over to Sarah and the staff to present this case. Thank you, Chair. Let me go ahead and share my screen. So this is a proposal, just let me get back to the beginning. This is a proposal to remove the existing rear addition and add a new larger rear addition. The property is located on the east side of 600 East 
between 200 South and 300 South and is in the Central City Historic District. You can see it highlighted on the aerial photo in yellow. There are a couple of photographs of the front facade. The photo on the left was taken earlier this year and the photo on the right is from a 1980 survey. You can see that there has been deterioration to the home. I wanted to note that the applicant plans to rehabilitate the existing residents. This rehabilitation is not included as a part of the request tonight. Staff anticipates that the rehabilitation can be reviewed with a minor alteration application at a later date. This is the site plan for the proposal. 600 East is shown on the left and much of the historic structure to be retained is shaded with hatch marks and the footprint of the addition is shown to the rear. This slide shows the north elevation with the existing conditions below. The existing rear addition, which can be identified by the windows at the rear that are an enclosed sleeping porch will be removed. The proposed addition is two stories. The peak of the gabled roof is just below the ridge on the historic structure. A, a crease that is approximately 10 inches deep and two feet wide delineates the addition from the historic structure. Additionally, the eaves on the addition are shallow to reflect its modern construction and differentiate it from the historic structure. The proposed exterior material is vertical wood siding and the proposed windows are aluminum clad wood and staff and the applicant work together to have the window pattern and proportions reflect those in the existing residence. The slide shows the south elevation and the existing conditions below. The existing rear porch would be removed. The addition would project further to the rear than the porch. The two-story portion of the addition on this elevation has a flat roof and extends approximately 10 and a half feet to the rear. Beyond this is a flat roofed porch that wraps around the rear of the addition. This is the rear elevation. The existing porch and addition would be removed. The north portion of the new addition would extend approximately 23 feet from the rear of the original structure. The two-story south portion of the addition would extend approximately 10 feet. Then the single-story porch would extend further and wrap around the rear. One item to note is that the diamond-shaped glass window would be removed from the existing rear facade and relocated to a similar location on the rear addition. On the gabled portion of the rear addition, there's a set of three windows that appear as a modern interpretation of a similar window pattern on the south side of the historic structure. In the staff report, there are two key considerations that have already been mentioned. The first is the primary consideration of this proposal, the removal of the existing historic addition and the construction of the new larger addition. It's staff's position that the proposed addition meets the adopted standards and guidelines. And then the second consideration is the rehabilitation of the existing dwelling. The dwelling needs significant rehabilitation, and while the necessary work is significant, the applicant intends to rehab the dwelling and staff anticipates that these items can be reviewed with a minor alteration application. Additionally, I wanted to mention that there have been two public comments received since the publication of the staff report, and those are included in the commissioner's drop box. And the staff's recommendation is for approval of the request with the condition included in the report. And this concludes my presentation. The applicant is also here and has a presentation. Um, I want to know if there are questions for staff at this point. Commissioners, uh, questions for Sarah? Can you go back to the east, the east elevation, please? There's a dormer that's there. Is that historic? And then there's a, one window being removed on the second floor. Is that the one you're talking about being relocated, Sarah? Right. So that so that dormer would have been would be historic. And then um, then this window right here. So it's this window right here um, would be relocated on the new rear addition, which um, extends out further from the, um, the I see. Okay. rear of the house. Uh, Sarah, this is Kenton. Maybe the applicant was going to address this, but I know it doesn't really matter to us, or it's not in our purview, but what are they going to do with all that space? I mean, it's already a very large house as it is, and they're adding a substantial amount of square footage to it. Is this going to be a one single residence, or will it be divided into apartments, or what's the thought? The plan is for a single family residence. Okay, thank you. Um, Sarah, are there 
Uh, I was trying to find in the staff report photographs of the uh, addition from a side view. Is is the current addition, um, does the roof of that addition, does that wing extend into the historic roof line or is that broken up? Um, let me see if you can see that on what I have here. So I think you can see how the roof line it's not as clear as probably you'd like, but I think you can see how the roof line continues across the top in that photograph. Um, the applicant may be able to address this better in his presentation too. And then there are um, photos of the, or not sorry, I'm not, not photographs, but there are existing elevation drawings that were included in the staff report in the applicant submittal. So you could always look at those um, existing elevations too. Okay. Hey, hey, not Richardson here. I'll jump in on that. And you know, based on the the, the roof line and the soffit and fascia, it appears as though that addition was a very, very early addition. And and perhaps could have been part of the original house, but it was early on, and it's an addition. Well, we have the Sanborn maps somewhere in there for. That do a pretty good job of tracking that, I think. So, those are in the applicant submittal as well. Any other comments? If not, we will um, turn the time over to the applicant. Um, whoever's here to speak for the applicant, if we could. Yeah. Hi. Can I can I share my screen? Sure, yeah, please. <laughs> give me just one minute here. We had to switch hosts. Michaela has a step away for a second. Issue going on with um. Give me one second. You should be able to share your soon. Okay. Uh, David, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I should. Um, my name is David Coford. I'm an architect at Naylor and with London Architects. Uh, here on behalf of the uh, owners of the property, Annette and Frank Lang Heinrich. Um, and so, uh, I mean, anything else you need me to? Introduce? Oh, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, all I really wanted, I think Sarah covered everything um, that we're trying to do, but I think I can probably answer some of the questions from the Commission. Um, one of the reasons for the added square footage, you know, yes, it is a, a larger property, but first off, the uh, the this is also one of the larger lots in the area, um, and so this stays well within the um, the the footprint requirements. Um, another aspect is that uh, uh, this is seen as a, a family property, so that family can um, uh, use it for potentially generations. Um, and with that, the, the owner has has lived here previously, and the intent of the project is to uh, rehabilitate the grand, we're calling them the grand rooms at the front of the building, the library, the dining room, the, what we're calling the music room, um, but then also have the facilities for more modern living towards the rear, um, more a bit more open plan, um, breakfast, uh, kitchen, living room. And so that's that's really where the scale of the, the property is coming from. Um, we we were aware of the scale. We are aware of, of the size of it. Um, and what we tried to do was um, minimize it at least at least. So the the view here at the top right is the the main view of the driveway where you get a, a less oblique. You get a, a better angle at the back of the property. And so that's why we stepped back um, the the facade there so that you um, you don't get the bulk of the the rear addition from the south. The north is it's less of a an angle you can see it from because of the um, adjacent property lines. Um, that I don't have the existing drawings in my um, in my 
uh, presentation here, but I can address uh, the question of the connecting roofline. We, from what we can un uh, ascertain, that the ad existing addition, the sleeping porch, um, it's from about 1911, so it's about 20 years after the original house was built. Uh, we can see the concrete foundations that are different from the sandstone. Um, and the roof was, uh, the, the main roof of the house was all re-roofed um, in the last decade. And so that was all part of that. But when you visit that sleeping porch, the, the shingle facade uh, of the original house is still behind that sleeping porch. So there's no real integration of um, building envelope except with the, with the roof. Um, and so um, I wonder if that's perhaps answered the questions you had initially. And then something else, just we, we were trying to replicate the front of the house to the back, you know, with this wrapping porch and a, an extending gable end just to give it the spirit of the original house, but um, not trying to, to mimic anything uh, in, in reality. Um, then, uh, as Sarah mentioned, the, the, one, the one moment of interest that we think is worth preserving is this back window, which you see from the interior here at the bottom right. And so if, if we can, uh, we, we'll look to, to move that. It'll be in, in roughly the same position as it was, just extended out further on the new addition. Uh, there was a comment about that that we received um, uh, on this application. And so we, I mean, we, on this matter, you know, it's, it's something that we thought would be a nice idea to preserve, but we'll absolutely take the recommendation of the commission on how you would rather us uh, address that. Um, and I think that's about all I think I need to add on top of what Sarah said. So um, I can leave this up or I, I can uh, turn it back over to you. Thank you. Um, we'll now open this up for uh, public comments. Uh, is there anyone here from the public to speak to this? Yeah, we have, um, let's see, Cindy Cromer first. Um, Cindy, go ahead, please. Hi, um, Cindy Cromer here. I own the two properties to the north of this 235 house and have long thought that it might be the work of Frederick Hale. I have not been able to confirm that yet, but I have long thought that um, he lived next door at 223 South. Um, I want to start by saying the architect's attention to the detail regarding the fenestration in the addition is admirable. I would urge you please to specify the color of the roofing shingle on the addition because the historic portion of the house was re-roofed recently with a very high quality, high definition asphalt shingle in brown. And um, there is nothing in the staff report that requires that the color match, um, which I think would be reasonable. Um, I spent two pages single space talking about this extraordinary lattice window. Um, if you have ever cleaned one, you know how extraordinary it is. If you've ever painted one, you know how extraordinary it is. And I have two very small ones and I was able to commission a leaded glass window for far less money. So that tells you the kind of respect I have for this extraordinary window. I have never seen one like it. I don't know why the earlier architects um, installed it on the rear facade, but it was clearly intentional um, and it's comparable to the over the top fenestration on the rest of the house. Um, I did consult with a very knowledgeable expert who thinks that it is important for this window to remain on the property. Obviously, I disagree. I think it should remain in the original um, earlier body of the house where it is currently. Um, it is in a 19th century wall, and I think that's important. Um, I went into details in my comments that you received in the Dropbox. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cindy. Anyone else, Wayne? 
I do not see any more hands raised, but if anybody is in the attendee list, remember that if you want to speak on an item, um, there's a little hand icon. And so if you would like to speak, go ahead and press that hand icon. I am not seeing anybody else that would like to speak. Okay. Uh, we'll turn this over to the commission then for uh, we'll end the public comment and uh, turn it in closed session for the commission. Commissioners, uh, your thoughts? I have a question for uh, David if um, to start things off. I'm, I'm just kind of wondering about the logic of that area, like why, why are you carving out? We don't have a second floor plan, so why are you carving out that volume above the port like what's the purpose of that on the second floor on the first floor i can see it's where the the living room extension is yeah it, it's it's just to we, we you know can we see the design the, the idea again is, sorry can we see the design again can we throw oh, that up on the screen of, of course uh, and, and it would be nice at some point to toggle back to the floor plan um uh, yeah i mean he's cute and all but let's see the floor plan Mm -hmm. There we go. It's just my accent. That's it. <laughs> it's the only thing we didn't get from the Brits was a good accent. <laughs> okay. So uh, the intent here is that, you know, this, this will become a single family residence in downtown, but um, the for, for the current residents and for their future, for, well, for their family going forward. And the idea is to give this house, uh, it's got a certain scale to it, and to give the, even in the upstairs, we want to make sure that the master bedroom has kind of a lot of the same facilities that a, a larger house somewhere outside the city might have, you know, with the, with the ensuite and the dressing rooms and things. And so the idea was to continue the extension to the second floor to provide for more bedrooms and, and um, a larger master suite um and also laundry facilities things like that on that upper floor yeah okay other comments um bravo thank god how many times do i drive by this house thinking it's going to go up in flames that cindy cromer's properties are going to go up in flames I didn't know that anyone had bought it. It's just been sitting there for years. It's been frightening to look at. I, I, I can't wait to see it redone. It is such a treasure. Um, yes, I have some comments. Uh, I don't know if you can hear the thunder and light. Thunder and light but yeah. You just had a nice story. Uh, turn my microphone off. Um, yes, I uh, echo what... Babs is stating, I'm excited to see this structure rehabilitated um, and restored. However, um, we will be losing a large portion of the historic rear elevation um, to accommodate that living space in the rear. Um, I understand the 1911 addition and that portion, but this is Feel, it feels like, I don't know the exact percentage, but maybe around 40% of the rear that's existing. So um, I do agree with Cindy when she stated that I would, uh, it's great that the window will stay on the property. However, it's preferable that it would be on the um, original rear of the structure. I'm not sure uh, if Sarah could answer this, but I didn't see any of the guidelines for the historic district in the staff report, Sarah. Maybe I missed those, but is there anything in the guidelines uh, in reference or in the code for the city's uh, code referencing loss of historic material? Or there, there are in the in the standards and the guidelines, and um, those are included in. Um, let me see where it is in there. Um, so the analysis for those would be in um, in F, and then the, the applicable design guidelines were in G, 
Um, and so there are references to um, to that in those guidelines as far as additions, um, and then also just regarding the loss of material. And um, you know, generally, I think the um, the idea is to to have them located to the rear and have them less visible, and um, have the roof step down, have a delineation from the original structure and the addition. And so, um, in the staff report, basically um, went over how it does meet those aspects of the guidelines. Thank you. And was the 1911 addition deemed contributory? Or? Sure, that is that is one question. Is you know whether that even though it's an addition has has kind of has gained um, kind of status as historic and. Um, I think that just given its location to the rear and the it's how it's less visible from other other areas of the structure and then also um, you can look at how it isn't as well integrated with the um, with the original structure there's some images that were included in the applicant submittal that show that it was staff's contention that um, you know given all of those things that the proposed addition met the the standards and the guidelines Okay, thank you, Sarah. Anybody else have any comments? Yeah, the Kenton here. I appreciate uh, the architects showing us the plan and the description of uh, <clears throat> why the uh, new addition and the and fits on the house and, and, and why they're doing that. That makes sense. Uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, I kind of echo what some others have said. I'm glad to see some attention being paid to this house. And if the loss of the 1911 edition is what it takes to get someone to make this house viable and to restore it, I think that's a small price to pay to uh, restore such a significant house. So I, I think this is a good approach and well well done. So I, I'm in favor of it. That's great. Any other comments? Well, Richardson here, I'm, I'm happy to speak. Um, <clears throat> like everyone else, we've been watching this house for decades. And um, I'm, I'm happy to see that it's hopefully has a new life. Um, however, I, I have a couple of uh, comments, and and, and the, the first is going to be at the front of the house, and I, I'm a, a little, um, I would say I'm a little leery of the project because not much has been discussed about the restoration of this mansion in general. And I think it should be put into the record that the restoration of uh, siding, architectural detailing, balustrades, columns, windows, historic windows, and so on is very, very, very important here. And if, um, if we were visiting this addition after the applicant had restored the front of the house, I think we would, you know, probably roll over and play dead and say, gosh, this is fantastic. But what I see here is that we're, we are asked to approve an addition uh, to a project where the owner has not showed us really what they plan to do with this historic mansion. This really, truly wonderful um, um, wood frame house I and mean, wood frame houses here in the seismic world are, are much sought after. And this is a particularly beautiful one. So to re reiterate, I, um, I, I think it's imperative that staff work with the applicant to make sure that the windows are restored, uh, restored, not replaced. And that uh, likewise columns and balustrades and uh, the important architectural features of this architectural masterpiece are also restored. Now, briefly moving to the back, I, I, um, I commend the architect for uh, a contemporary interpretation 
Um, hopefully you can hear me over the thunder in the background. Um, uh, but I, I'm concerned that the addition crenellates back and then a little bit for a few feet and then back out to uh, the, the original, the, the side lines of the existing house. I think this addition would be far more successful if it was just four to six inches smaller on each side than the existing structure. I think it would read as, it would just read architecturally so much better and stronger. And uh, there's a little confusion depending on which drawing we look at, but the, the floor plan that's included in our packet just shows this almost as an extrusion back. And I think if it, it architecturally it appears as though there's room to work with and it might even save the applicant a little bit of money to make this thing a foot smaller overall um, in the south dimension. So that my recommendation is just a, a wee bit smaller um, so that it reads as an addition and not an extrusion onto the existing house and that the, uh, the very, very important windows and architectural details of the home be preserved. Thank you. Thank you, David. Any other comments? We prepared as a commission to approve this. We have a formal vote, but is there anybody that's going to be objecting that wants to object to approving this tonight? If not, then hopefully someone will make a motion. I will make a motion. Um, um, let's see. <clears throat> Uh, based on the findings listed in the staff report uh, regarding PLNHLC 2021-00366, major alteration at 235 South 600 East, the information presented and input received during the public hearing, I move that the Historic Landmark Commission approve the request for a certificate of appropriateness mm -hmm. for the major alteration for the removal of the existing rear addition and construction of a new rear addition for the proposal at 235 South 600 East as presented in PLNHLC 2021-00366 with the condition listed in the staff report. And I might add that um, the owners are encouraged to continue the roofing color on the new addition that is in the front part of the standing structure. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second. I think you might have been muted, David. Thank you, Aiden. We have a second, so we'll take a vote now. Um, all those in favor of the motion, Babs? Aye. John? Aye. Aiden? Aye. Kent? Yes. Aye. Victoria? Aye. David? Uh, abstain, thank you. Okay, well, that, uh, that's approved. Uh, thank you for everybody for your comments and thoughts on this, and uh, good luck to the applicant in uh, getting this completed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your time. I appreciate that. Oh, the neighborhood can't wait. <laughs> this would be awesome. Is, is anyone else getting hail? Uh, no, but that was some sideways rain just a minute ago. I'm on Foothill, and... We have lots of hail. Oh yeah, my gosh, I'm I'm here on A Street and First Avenue, and it, um, the, the lightning was right outside the window. It's really cool. Yeah, <laughs> I had tickets to Red Butte tonight. I gave them away. Oh, smart. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's not supposed to rain for days and days after this, but right when the Utah tried to play a football game, they got dumped on. Well, it was just temporary, though. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this is, it, it's, it's just Weber State. Come on, Weber State. Bah. I mean, tip off was only six minutes ago or kickoff. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Perfect timing. Yeah. Right. Um, we're now going to go into a, uh, 
a matter that was begun. I wasn't here, but in July, uh, those of you who were who heard this matter on the cemetery fence, uh, mm -hmm. can turn the time over to Amy. If I could jump in really fast, sorry, Amy. I'm going to cut Amy off really quick. Just uh, um, 15th, we're getting hail now. Nice. <laughs> this item uh, is a continuation, but the public hearing was closed. Um, but we have received a couple of emails that came in during this meeting. We have uh, we can't read those emails because the the public hearing was closed, but we did forward those emails um, to the, the commission members just to mm. let you know. Thank you. Yeah, I've seen those. I've had a chance to read them. I think other people should be able to have seen them. So um, Aiden, you have a question? Yes. Can I just make a inquiry before we begin the next item? Um, I just may if the rest of the commission or um, staff could help answer this, that would be helpful. But I'm just wondering, um, in general, should we be thinking as a commission towards retaining like something along the lines of National Registrar eligibility? or um, anything along those lines when making decisions for approval of historic districts, or is that not in our purview to be thinking towards um, helping historic structures retain, retain as much um, form and materiality as possible to keep eligibility? I can kind of answer that one. Um... I mean, it's not part of your standards necessarily. Um, I think in theory, following the standards would help retain that eligibility. And I think that's the general intent. So let's, I guess, stay within the authority of the Landmark Commission and, and review this project by the standards that um are based off the national park service right right thanks michaela i wasn't thinking about the the next item just in general um i think for something like the the addition on the last item it would would potentially lose its eligibility so i just didn't know if that's something we should um be considering so thank you for answering that that's helpful no that's okay i'm and and i think you know, the state has their program and, and we can be a bit more flexible with ours. Um, and we try to sort of not be entirely the same because we're not the same, but our standards are based off National Park Service and we endeavor to try to n not um, affect eligibility negatively. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Um, Amy, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me share my screen. Okay, can everyone see that? Perfect. Uh, so this is a request by Emily Utt, representing the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who's the owner of the property for a special exception and associated minor alterations to increase the height of an existing historic fence surrounding the Brigham Young Cemetery. Uh, the Brigham Young Cemetery is a landmark site um, also located within the South Temple Local Historic District. Uh, based on planning staff's analysis and findings, the request fails to meet the standards of approval and therefore staff is recommending the commission deny this request. Uh, the site fronts on First Avenue. It's located between State Street and A Street and 140 East and First Avenue. Uh, the rock wall was built around the cemetery in September of 1877. In the 1880s, iron fencing and gates were added to the rock wall around the Brigham Young grave, which was fashioned and fabricated by William J. Silver, a successful ironworks business businessman who established his career in Salt Lake City. Uh, the narrative submitted by the applicant 
uh, notes that the cemetery has seen significant increase in trespassing and vandalism in recent years, and they believe that increasing the height of the fence um, will significantly improve security on the site. Uh, the commission did hear this item at the January 15th uh, landmark commission meeting, and the item was tabled uh, to allow for revisions to the proposal that address the issues of security and historic preservation simultaneously. Um, I've included a summary of the comments and the discussion um, from the July 15th meeting. Um, these points were also included in the staff memo. Um, there was some discussion about the number of security incidents, uh, other options to increase security on the site, um, the potential for reversing these changes, um, the fence being an original character defining feature of the site built by a notable person, um, whether or not taller fencing will be a solution to the security issues, uh, the purview of the commission regarding security, and the site being a culture of land cultural landscape versus a residence and the applicable standards of approval. Um, there was also a link to uh, the previous Landmark Commission meeting in the staff memo. Um, in response to this discussion at the uh, January 15th meeting, uh, the applicant has made some revis revisions to the proposal, um, the most notable being the um, removal of the request for additional height along the streetscape along First Avenue, so that's the north elevation. Um, they're no longer pursuing um, increased height on that elevation. Um, and that will just remain as is and just re repairs are repo just repairs are proposed. Um, the overall fence height is not changing in the revised proposal. Um, they're still seeking the incre increased fence height on the east, west and south elevations. Um, they're requesting to increase it by two feet. The existing fence is three feet. Um, the retaining wall varies in height around the site. They're not proposing any changes to the retaining wall height. Um, but the proposed overall combined fence and retaining wall height, um, the request is five feet to nine feet, 41, 9.41 feet. Um, additionally, they altered the proposal to have it taper down towards the streetscape. Um, you can see that in the bottom elevation, uh, that taper is set back about uh, 11 feet. Um, I do want to note that staff is um, sympathetic to the security issues on the site and the, the complexities surrounding that. But ultimately, when we looked at those standards of approval, um, we were not able to find compliance with the special exception standards or the standards for minor alteration. Um, in regard to the special exception standards, the revisions to the proposal keep the existing fence size of the north elevation adjacent to First Avenue as is. And that does help to address uh, the standards related to compatibility and brings the proposal more in line with the character of front yard fences in the avenues where um, fence heights in front yards are generally um, lower in height. However, the proposal is still in conflict with the special exception standards that speak to destruction of historic features of significant importance and compliance with the purpose of the H preservation overlay. Uh, the revisions of the proposal do not change planning staff's initial analysis uh, related to the proposed alteration for the certificate of appropriateness. Staff still finds that the proposal does not comply with those standards for a landmark site. The fence is an original character defining feature of the landmark site and it has remained unaltered since its construction in the 1880s. The proposal to modify the existing historic fence by adding additional height would have a negative impact on the historic integrity of one of the original character defining features of the site and the setting. Uh, the standards for the certificate of appropriateness speak to preserving distinctive, distinctive finishes, features, and construction techniques, techniques. And staff also discussed the alterations and importance of alterations being reversible. Staff's of the opinion that the proposed alterations um, would not be easy, easily removed without impairing the integrity of the fence. Um, staff also thinks that the proposed modifications could hinder the ability to interpret the age of the fence and differentiate the historic features from the new features. Um, I have included some um, photos of the property. Um, some of these pictures on the next slide were also taken from inside the actual cemetery. Um, the one on the top shows the East elevation um, where that driveway slopes down next to the um, Brigham Apartments. Um, the photo on the right, top right, is the fence in between 
um, the dwelling on the west and the cemetery. And then this is just a corner kind of panoramic view of the fence. Um, these photos are taken from inside the cemetery. You can see the fence um, there with the exception of that bottom left hand corner, which is from the public way, looking at the west elevation of the fence. And um, this slide outlines the public process for uh, this type of application. Um, staff did receive one additional public comment um, ahead of tonight's meeting that I added into the Dropbox. Um, and again, staff reviewed the project for compliance with the standards of approval for certificate of appropriateness and the specific special exception standards for fence height and the general special exception standards and um, could not find compliance with those standards and we are recommending denial on this application. Thank you. Uh, Wayne and um, Michaela, are we under uh, any obligation to open this up for public hearing again or you suggested we are done with that? Um, we are not under any obligation. Okay. The public hearing was closed. Does any, does any of the commissioners have any questions for Amy? No, this has been a hard project, Amy. God bless you for taking it on. Well, let's go ahead and uh, then let's go ahead and discuss it as a commission. Does uh, uh, thoughts of the different commissioners? Yeah, this. I don't know if this is um, insensitive or not, but why don't they just electrify the fence they've got there? The electricity comes on at 10 at night and turns off at six in the morning, just like a cattle fence. That you works know? for me. I don't think that's legal in the city. It, it, <laughs> not <it's> allowed. <laughs> to, to Kenton's point, there are a lot of, um, I think there are many creative solutions to the challenge of perceived security issues um, other than altering this historic structure. So, I mean, Kent, I'm with you. Whether yeah. it's electric or not, there are other ways to accomplish this. And um, I, I think that the applicant, in my personal opinion, has been cold and insensitive to the historic structure and the needs of the community and historic district. Mm -hmm. Babs muted. Agreed, David. I'm with you. I, that's bold. <laughs> <laughs> I I really want to protect this, um, and I agree with you. I I'm surprised that with all of the big brains they have, that they haven't been able to figure this out and be as sensitive to the historic nature that we try and preserve. I, I completely agree. And I want this to be preserved and I don't want it to be vandalized. And it's it's just a cool little oddity we have right there in the middle of downtown. So come on guys. I too worry we're clearly um, facing kind of a huge crisis right now with homelessness and uh, with our enforcement structures needing to be bolstered right now. And it does feel like we're making historic preservation decisions in reaction to what are hopefully short term issues that find resolution quickly. So I do hate the idea of sacrificing that long term historic integrity for a short term problem. Victoria, you're right on. Yeah. We should talk, David. Yes, we <laughs> should. <laughs> the the applicant is here if you would like to hear from the applicant. Would the applicant like to speak? Yes, I would. Thank you. This is Emily Utt. Um, I, I take some offense to the comment that we have been cold and insensitive to the needs of the historic district. Um, as a resident of Salt Lake City and a frequent attender of the cemetery, this is, this is a sacred place to us and this is a sacred place, I think, to the community. And as much as I hate to see a fence need to be modified, I am more concerned about the risk that is being done right now to 
human remains that are buried in this in this district. This is a cemetery. This is a sacred place. And I I'm a little dismayed that we are privileging a fence over protection of family memory. Um, the people that are buried here are loved and treasured by their descendants and loved and treasured um, by this entire community. And what we are trying to do is find a balance, trying to keep the grave safe, try to keep the site safe, try to keep this a place of sanctity and reverence while acknowledging that we have ongoing and ever increasing security issues and acknowledging that we are in an urban core that is in a, a dramatic shift. Um, I, I live near here and I walk through this area almost every day and I see a shift happening in our community. And I, I care as much. I would love to not have to modify this fence, but I have been working with our team. We have been working with security personnel, working with architects, working with construction crews, trying to figure out how to protect this. And uh, a modification to a fence seems a small price to pay to save a place long-term and keep it open. A, a question, Emily, and, and yeah. I apologize if you took offense to an earlier comment. Um, have any of these graves been exhumed by passers-by or people breaking in? I mean, have they actually dug up, dug up graves and damaged remains or personal? They have not, but you know, they, there have been headstones stolen in the last 18 months. Okay, yeah. Uh, Ms. Ott, I, I hear your pain and I, and I share it. Um, I'm deeply tied to my ancestors and completely understand what you feel. In this case, the ancestors that we're speaking of actually belong to all of us. We owe them a debt of gratitude uh, for the planning that they put into the city. In your estimation, is this alteration to the fence the only way to accomplish the safety or are there other alternatives that can be investigated. What is is your contention that this is the missing piece to securing the environment? Yeah, I, we are we are investigating a number of other security options for this site: increased patrols, um, lighting, you know, changes to plantings, all those other kind of less invasive. And we're seeing this fence modification really as one of the prongs in a multi-pronged approach. Um, acknowledging that no single thing is going to solve this problem moving forward. I, I ask because as a now beneficiary of the people who planned this city and the mother of children whose grandparents crossed the plains and, you know, were, were influential in, in some of these similar movements, I know it seems like a fence, but that fence is historic and mm -hmm. the long-term preservation of it so that when we solve this issue with enforcement and homelessness that we can still enjoy that that feels like it has to be a priority my kids will never see that site and and the site of the man who sent their grandfather down to find timpanogos cave the same way i've been able to if we alter it and that feels like a decision we should be making with much more gravitas and with a much longer historical perspective than what we've discussed so far at least in my estimation if that makes sense I would agree. I um I I think I, I have a, a small small difference with staff that I I feel that this fence would re, be reversible if we resolve some of these issues, um, uh, undoing a weld and having to you know recast the bottom six inches of a picket, um, I think is in the the world of construction is a a very small repair. Um, we're not really advocating, especially on the front facade that is the most kind of historic visible from the street. Um, we listened to your comments from the last staff meeting about not changing that front. So the gates are not modified. The corner posts that are most visible are not modified. Um, the, the modifications really are in the, in the bar stock, in the pickets um, that are more easily cut back down if at some future date. Um, we really do have the kind of city where we don't have to think about crime and homelessness in, in an urban area. Any other questions for the uh, or Emily? Uh, any other uh, comments between commissioners uh, that anyone wants to make?
I'm pretty torn on this one. I mean, as has been pointed out, I don't know how reversible this this is. If you weld an old wrought iron fence, and I, I know Emily, I think it, it would take some serious technical prowess on the part of a metal worker to unweld the fence and put it back to how it is now. Um, I just wonder if we're we're missing something in the middle, some sort of compromise that could achieve both the security that is obviously needed and that I think we all recognize is important to um, to the applicant and to the the people who frequent the cemetery um, versus kind of material materially altering a, a historic um, kind of a character defining feature of the property. Um, I, w these public comments weren't read online, but I take issue with some of the, some of the conceits that people are making on this topic. I think it's pretty nuanced and people should recognize that it's not that we're, this is a purely aesthetic choice. And we're saying that, um, protection of human remains isn't important. Um, I think we all agree on that. It's, it's just. Is there a way we could do this that would would benefit everybody? And I don't know if that's a an inner fence that is more security based, while leaving the the more decorative fence um, on the exterior, or like as other commissioners have said, if it's maybe a completely different method of security than making a taller fence. Because at least in my mind, the fence isn't impenetrable if someone wants to get through it they will um but i'm i'm pretty torn um i hear i hear the pain on the part of the the property owners and i think desecrating a a burial site is is a horrendous thing to do to be honest so uh, one question i have uh if i may which is is it possible or is this totally out of line is it possible that this could be uh, sheltered in some way that that a structure could be built over it or around it you know, perhaps um i i was kicking that around in my own mind and and i'm worried that that, that could perhaps be more uh could detract more from the cemetery um then then uh, the perhaps a temporary spent solution um but I, i'd like to weigh in because this is my personal neighborhood um i, I live perhaps 800 feet away from it and I, and I pass it as i walk back and forth to the alta club in downtown and when i moved to this neighborhood in 1992 it was considered dangerous in fact there were three murders within us within an avenues block of our house in the first year that we lived here on a street um <clears throat> and of course the neighborhood got better and in recent years i think the city has been experiencing uh, a, a large degree of homelessness for a variety of reasons um and and i see this as a placebo um that that raising a fence or putting a higher fence on I think as a placebo for what I certainly as a resident here, I optimistically think that this is a transient problem. <clears throat> and, and I say that a, a little bit tongue in cheek that transients are an issue in the park, but I think that it, at least I hope as a resident of this neighborhood, that the, the security concerns that the Brigham Young uh, Park has experienced are, will pass. I'm, I'm with Victoria. I think that this is a transient problem in our city and our mayor and, and the church and the Is that David's computer or is it uh, mine? I think it's David's, <laughs> but I was wondering that too. <laughs> yeah, I think Big Brother has shut him down. Ah. I was going to say someone. <laughs> waiting for David to come back. Um, kind of 
thinking of what Babs had to say and the concerns about once you change that fence by welding other things on, how likely is it to ever be restored to to its original state? And hopefully the temporary nature of the problems that the cemetery is facing, what would people think about removing the historic fence completely, storing it safely, and erecting a five foot tall fence around the whole thing that is of the design that they've shown. But in a few years when it's not a problem anymore, that fence could easily be removed and the original one returned. I know that the church was very good um, preserving the iron in the front of ZCMI for several years and brought that back after restoring it. Um, it just, it, I don't see the problem ever getting better. It is going, it's going to be vandalized and more vandalized and more vandalized. I just, I don't, I'm not optimistic about this and I want to help them and I want to help us preserve this site. Um, and we're just kind of spinning around. I think a lot of us have the same feelings and we're not coming up with great solutions. And I know that that the church can come up with a better solution. They, they've they just done so many miracles with so many other preservation in this city. We're, we're almost there, we want to help, um, but we need to preserve this. And, and the, the history of this is phenomenal. I mean, we don't have a lot of things like this around. Can you see this is like green? May I speak, please? Let me introduce Greg Green spoke at the last meeting. He's our project manager on site. If I may. Um, Go ahead, Greg. I just, um, this whole entire site is a very sacred historical site. It's not just the fence. And we believe with so much thought and effort, um, we're not just simply brushing something tied under the rug to sweep away a problem. We believe that the problems with transience is going to continue as this city continues to grow. I believe that that's a very long-term issue that the city is going to continue, continue to deal with. Uh, with the al minor alterations to the fence, we're hoping to make this inviting for people to come to. We don't want to put another fence up and make it more restrictive looking or anything that would uh, push people away. This is it's a very sacred place for the church, but it, you know, it, I can't tell you how attached I am to this, to the cemetery and what's there and what it represents and want to preserve the entire facility and raising the fence a little bit. You're right. People are going to climb over a 12 foot fence if they want to bad enough and they're going to try. But if we can make a small deterrent so that it um, deflects people away or discourages them from getting in there, um, it would get the greatest benefit for the smallest effect. The front along the street will be the same and, and understandably so. We tried to be compromising uh, with you with this next set of plans that we've given, it was what this commission asked for in the last meeting, if we could create a setback. And we've done that in a way that can not be so dramatic as far as moving back on the sides as stark and straight up, um, it's gradual. Um, it seems like this is a really good option to the challenges we have. Ideally, like, like Emily said, we don't want to change it. We would rather not, but the conditions are negating it. A hundred years ago, things were substantially different in Salt Lake City as to what we're dealing with on a very regular basis here. And 
at the end of the day, we're just trying to preserve this so generations can come and enjoy this place. Thank you. Could I, could I ask, this is a really dumb question, but is this the original burial site? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And then I like mentioned in the other meeting, there are also about 40 other burials at this site. Thank you. So um, I should have said this at the beginning and it slipped my mind because I'm not involved in this in any way, but I spend um, 90% of my day uh, representing the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on legal matters. I've had nothing to do with this one, and but I am recusing myself from any comment or vote or anything else. Uh, I didn't think I needed to leave the meeting because I have no involvement with it. I wasn't going to say anything. So, Hannah, I'm happy to leave if you think I should. But otherwise, uh, I'll just continue to be quiet. But someone needs to to move the meeting along. Well, I'm happy to present a motion. I'm I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Moroni's gone, but somehow. Uh, I lost my connectivity here briefly. Yeah, hang on a minute, David. Um, Ken, yeah. would you take over chairing the, the, this uh, matter, please? Yeah, I'd be happy to do that, Robert. Appreciate your candor on this. Thank you. Uh, so, and let, do any other commissioners wish to make a comment uh, or ask any questions about this? But David, do you, do you want to wrap up the thought before you got disconnected? Yeah, I'm not sure how much you heard, but you know, I, I've lived here for 30 years. There were multiple murders in the neighborhood. When I first moved in, the neighborhood got better. Now, temporarily, the neighborhood is worse. I'm optimistic that our city will improve in the next decade and that uh, the powers that be in our city will all work to improve the underlying issues. Um, and, and so, uh, personally, I, I, I don't see a need for uh, this level of change for security, and, and that is really irrelevant to us anyways as a Landmarks Commission. And um, that, you know, the, the Silver Iron Works um, has been associated with uh, producing things like the oxen in the baptismal font, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so this is a, 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 an important a historical feature in our neighborhood. So, based on the analysis and findings listed in the staff report and information presented and the input received in the last few minutes, I move that the Historic Landmark Commission deny the request for a special exception for additional fence height and the associated certificate of appropriateness. The request fails to comply with the standards of approval in 21A52060 and 21A34020 G. This of course is a motion for uh, 140 East First Avenue PLN HLC 2021 457 and 604. There has been a motion to deny this request. Does any commissioner wish to second that motion? If we follow through with this, the applicant cannot return with a request like this for a year. Is that correct? That is my understanding. Uh, Hannah? A special exception. I think that's what we discussed at the last meeting. Um, but there was a prohibition on how soon you could come back with a new request. But they can come back with a certificate of appropriateness tomorrow. You're right. <clears throat> Just not the special ex exception? Is that what you said, would, Michaela? Can you please talk us through that again just to be sure we understand? I'm not quite clear myself. One year. Yes, to come back with a, a similar special exception request, they would have sort of a cooling off of one year for the special exception. But a certificate of appropriateness, um, they could come back tomorrow. 
And if we vote and just to remind the commission, sorry, this is Amy, the planner. Um, the special exception is specific to the increased fence height. That's what the special exception is for. And, and is that for increased height of this proposal? Or could they come in and say we want a high fence is brand new? I believe it says that they can't come in with a proposal that's basically similar to what they came with before. So I don't think that they could come in with a new increased fence height proposal, but I'll I'll let Michaela or Hannah better answer that. I mean, I think the intent is that an application doesn't get denied and we have different cooling off periods within the code that we just don't they that applicants just don't keep coming back with the same request over and over and over right. and that you have to keep hearing the same request because um with these land use applications you know we have to follow through with due process and there's a process and then if the code requires a public hearing we need to hold the public hearing and so the intent isn't to come back with the same exact request over and over if that makes sense so if we vote for this motion we are voting to deny i just want to make sure if it's a, a yay or a nay vote so if i vote nay then i'm saying i'm for this project correct and no since since the motion was to deny mm -hmm. and i would support that motion to deny a nay would say you disagree i hate those kind of votes <laughs> double negatives right. yeah right. <laughs> One thing yeah. to point out, though, is if the applicant is denied, there is an appeal process where they can take it before the city arbitrator. Uh -huh. And that decision may support us or it may contradict the findings of this commission. Sure. The applicant would have 30 days to appeal to the appeals hearing officer. And the appeals hearing officer would walk, read the staff report, listen to the meetings, watch the videos, etc. And they can appeal on grounds other than financial hardship. If they just disagree with our ruling, they, that's enough to get them back hearing. If we made mistakes in due process, if we didn't make proper findings of fact, um, if we were arbitrary and capricious. Would it make sense to vote separately on the special exceptions versus a certificate of appropriateness? In other words, for me, I don't have issue with the fact that the it's a taller fence. I have issue with the fact that it's altering a historic fence. Yeah, John, I'm with you on that one. I mean, if they just came in and put a new fence on the inside and left the historic fence on the outside, and and perhaps it's a new fence that's somewhat transparent or electrified. Um, you know, there's so many solutions to this challenge, and um, I I'd just love to see a more a creative solution than what we've been seeing here. I just feel like we're we're treading water. We keep hearing the same thing. Well, you can make. It was one combined motion, but you can separate them out or vote on this particular motion. Well, with respect to that, David, would you like to modify your motion? No, I, I think I'm going to let the motion stand. I, I think staff okay. has worked with these people and uh, this applicant and um, and that is staff recommendation and i i'm very very happy to support our, our our esteemed staff in this regard very good then do we have a second to the motion to deny this request we appear to be lacking a second to this motion uh commissioners would one of you like to present another motion. We have we closed executive session because I really like, I, I feel no peace voting in either direction on this at this moment. And 
I don't feel a ton of peace about just being an obstructionist entity either and just saying, go back and come back again. I, I really would like to have a legitimate executive dis executive session discussion about what legitimately we can and and should do at this moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, it feels like the most legitimate thing is what John just said, which is separate out the fact that we don't care if something is taller, but the historicity of this element is preserved. But is that even in our purview to suggest? I think that they're interconnected. Well, the way they've been presented by the applicant, they're interconnected. They are. I mean, we, we could say we want um, the height of this fence to uh, remain at its historic level and the historic fence to remain on the uh, primary facades, which in my opinion are the First Avenue facade and at a bare minimum, the front yard setbacks of that, which are probably 25 feet. Um, but you know, beyond that, I, I think that the argument has been made that that the creator of this fence was a very, very important uh, contributor to the history of our city, and that in that regard, this fence, although it may seem like it's trite or small, is an important historical element in our community. And so, perhaps that fence remains. And then once we get beyond the front yard setback that some kind of other device is installed um, to, to meet the needs of the applicant. And I, quite frankly, I don't think a higher fence is going to improve security. Um, I've watched the Carlton Hotel on South Temple recently. Um, they boarded it up and transients moved in. They fenced it, transients moved back. The SWAT team came in and did a practice run and cleared the transients out. They added another level of fencing and guess what? The transients came back. So the, I think the lesson learned there is, is that taller fences don't necessarily make better neighbors, nor do they improve security. Um, and, and so it's not our purview to say, sure, put it up a 20 foot wall and secure this place. Our purview is, historic elements in the historic nature of our neighborhoods and um and you know five feet ten feet twenty feet um people will find a way in i also am unsure if the addition of a fence um would help the cause of our purview that when looking at the site as a whole to preserve um, what we've been talking about, visibility from the street or um, Victoria, I'm so grateful for what you've shared about your family and your statements um, and like the way that your kids will be able to view the site. It just, that also to me just doesn't feel like the best solution. Um, however, I'm also, I am also conflicted on my response and, and do want want to have an answer. I just, I don't know what that answer is. Um, I don't think that the applicant's uh, intentions are to contribute to the urban uh, design element of hostile architecture, but I also want to keep that in mind of um, what what other possible solutions could look like. So I, I'm, yeah, I'm also feeling conflicted. Um, could I ask a question, Michaela? I, um, yeah, but I, please go ahead. go ahead. But I definitely want the if before you answer before you ask me a question, uh -huh. since everyone's grappling with the special exception for height, please go to your staff report because staff is finding that pretty much almost every standard for a special exception is not met. <clears throat> so if if the commission would like to make findings of fact on all of those standards that would be that's going to be hard to we do. would need I to mean, go yeah right. staff has done a great job here and and um sorry bab i think it's become an emotional thing i mean how much protection yeah. does, does brother brigham need 
I, I mean, I, we I, bring I, up the grave of or Porter Orrin Rock Rockwell and put him at the front gate. No, um, Michaela, but yes. way back, way back when in uh, planning and zoning, sometimes we had issues where we would actually establish a committee of some planners to work with an applicant to hopefully bring something back to the full committee. Do we ever do that here? You could form an arch architectural subcommittee. Mm -hmm. You could. Um, there is some, the only danger in doing that is that not the, a quorum couldn't meet. And even if a few members thought that, okay, we're in a great place, you could go back in front of the entire commission and it could be denied. And, and that's actually happened to me as a planner. And um, it's super uncomfortable. Um, you could sure. have a work session as well, too. That mm -hmm. way we're, di we're discussing it like in the public. Oh, the right burden on the applicant here, the burden on the applicant is to come back and speak to those standards as well. Just yeah. Compliance yeah. with the zone, that it's not substantially impairing property values within the neighborhood. You know, is there an adverse impact with the extra height mm -hmm. to the character of the area? It's just compatibility it with development. I mean, yeah. we're, 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 getting, we're getting nowhere here. It's not so. all on the commission so, to, to come up with that on the fly for an applicant. So the applicant's been into us twice. Uh, they they make a point that they they acted upon some of the suggestions or or, or ideas that were raised last time. Uh, yet it still doesn't seem to be successful in terms of meeting the criteria of the standards. Uh, I think it. The applicant has a lot of lot of design and historic horsepower on their side. I, I don't think we'd get anywhere by forming a committee of some sort. I think we either got to give them a yay or a nay here and let this thing take its course. Uh, you know, even if the, it, it doesn't go in the applicant's favor, then at least there's a decision. It's not up in the air. If it does go in their favor, well, then they're off and running. So uh, I, I don't know that we've officially rescinded David's motion. Uh, I, I think if it's legal here, I would I would keep that open and, and ask again if there are any commissioners who are willing to second Commissioner Richardson's motion to deny. And if there aren't, then we need a new motion. I think that that was a, a great point, Kenton, in her staff's findings that this proposal hasn't met any of the criteria that we are contemplating for this um, this decision, I would second that motion made by David. Thank you. We have a motion to deny and a second. I will take a vote. Uh, John? An I vote means you're in, you agree with denial. A nay means you disagree with denial. Um. Nay. Thank you, Babs. Nay. Victoria. I do not like this vote. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say nay. All right, David. Well, I'm going to vote for my own motion, but I was hoping to move this along. Mm. Yeah, so we have an I and and Aiden. I uh, muted. <laughs> Thank you. Say again, please. I. Very good. That motion fails on a vote of two to three. So, uh, is there a commissioner willing to present another motion? in regards to this matter. We've got nine paragraphs to overcome here to, yeah, I don't know, it's gonna be a hard one. Can you vote <laughs> <in> or? <clears throat> and I would like 
sorry, go ahead and Aiden, but I would certainly like some bindings cited, please. Or motion to continue or something. I did note. I did note in the motion sheet the specific findings that the commission would need to make. Uh, the specific standards the commission would need to make findings on for an alternate motion. Um, so you don't have to go flip back through um, to the different attachments of the staff report. I did include those specific ones in the motion sheet just for reference. And you have six of them under O two O G, and another three under O six O. So. I, you know, it is what it is. So the commissioners who voted nay, would you take a look at um, that staff's alternate findings and see if you can find grounds to make a motion to approve this request? I'm not sure that there's any middle ground here. And if there is, please let us know. To me, it goes back to voting between a certificate appropriateness and special exceptions. That's been done in the past. I've presented projects to the commission where we've voted separately on the special exceptions. That's why I denied the motion. So if they didn't apply for a certificate of appropriateness, we could still grant them one? Is that, is that the situation, John? And we still have to overcome some of these um, issues outlined by staff, but <clears throat> fire away, John. Yeah, John, can you take a stab at how you'd pull those two elements apart and let us let us move somewhere on this? Or can we do a straw poll on each of the nine? Yeah, let, let me. Let's see. Let me find them here. Uh, They're in the motion sheet, if that helps. Um, yeah, that's both where motion I sheets. Am. We got uh, seven. So I guess 21A34020 G in the motion sheet has items two through nine. Uh, let me let me back up just for a moment, please. Uh, Amy, well, would you clarify which part of this is seeking special exception and which part is certificate of appropriateness? I mean, Because I'm not clear how we can separate the two if they're looking for a higher fence. So I'm looking at attachment G. I assume I'm looking at the right thing. But it's like under A. So there, there's a separate motion sheet in your Dropbox um, that was revised from the last meeting. So there's three special exception standards. Um, and those relate to the fence height. Um, I, I guess I'm a little confused how you would separate those because they're so closely tied. Um, every special exception that comes to the landmark commission also has to have a minor alterations associated with it. So essentially, if you're approving the special exception, I don't quite understand how that's not also approving the minor alteration. Um, they do have separate standards. They're just so connected that um, I don't know what would be the point of, let's say, approving the special exception, um, because effectively it's still denied if you if you deny the certificate of appropriateness. Does that make sense? I mean, the commission can certainly yeah, I do can that. The, but... I can see the opposite, where a certificate of appropriateness would be approved and a special exception would be denied. But I, uh, John, I I <clears throat> I think. From the certificate of appropriateness perspective, we could say thou shalt 
leave the historic fence the way it is. And from a special exception perspective, we say, well, if you want to come and, and propose a new structure that leaves the existing, then uh, it you know, could comply with 21A52060, A, C, and E. Um. And I honestly, okay, I just make sure I'm looking at the right document, though, because we have two of them, right? Um, yeah. Because I was looking at. We can help John with what your intent is if you want to <laughs> kind of expand on it a little. Well, OK, I that might explain part of it, because like I'm looking at maybe the old document because it says so this is where some of my findings were questioned. I was questioning some of the findings. It says. The proposed fence and wall height of seven feet along First Avenue would create a walled in effect, but under this meeting, it's not seven feet along First Avenue. Yeah, so in the staff memo in the discussion section, um, staff addresses those standards that relate to compatibility. Um, so the, the specific special exception standards that staff believes that the project does not meet are the one related to does it comply with the purpose of the zoning district, the H preservation overlay, uh, the destruction of significant features, and let me look at what the last one was. Um, a, C, and E. Yeah, A, C, and E. So. A is compliance with the zoning ordinance and district purpose. C, no undue adverse impact. And E, no destruction of significant features. And this modification of the height, that's considered destruction because of the alteration to that historic level? Yeah. yeah, staff found that the proposed alteration would have a negative impact on a character defining feature of this landmark site. Um, and the commission, you know, could make alternate findings on that, um, but those were staff's findings. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that clarification, because I've been having a hard time separating the uh, special exception uh, from certificate of appropriateness. With the proposal they've got, they're inextricably connected. Uh, to right. what Dave was saying, if if the existing fence was left as is, and they wanted to do something else that attained that five foot height or what have you, then we could look at a special exception to allow their new proposed element to exceed the height, and it would leave the fence, the existing fence. But from where I'm reading it, as much as I and, and sympathetic to their security needs. So we've got to go by the standards. And I think the way you've laid them out, uh, it, it's clear that we can't approve this. Um, I would have voted with the minority and in, if I wasn't Kenton, acting in the- uh, After this discussion, I think I voted wrongly, even though it doesn't sit well in my heart after yeah. the standards, I think we should reintroduce the motion as much as it pains me to say that. Okay. W would you be willing to do so? Hang on, let me pull up the motion sheet. I just want to say I must still be young if I can read these motion sheets off of an iPhone, okay? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Truth. You got it flaunted. <laughs> Truth right there. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so we're doing the motion consistent with staff report, correct? If that's what you wish to do, yes. Based on the analysis and findings listed in the staff report, information presented, and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Historic Landmark Commission deny the request for a special exception for additional fence height and the associated certificate of appropriateness. The request fails to comply with the standards of approval in 21A.52.060 and 21A.34.020.G. Very good. We have a motion to deny the request. We have a second for that motion, please. I'll second that motion. Okay, thank you, Aiden. We have a motion and a second. We will take a vote. 
Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I believe you need to restate the petition numbers. Oh yeah, just add that it's PLN HLC 2021, 457 and 604. <clears throat> All right, are we good with that motion and second then? Legal team? Okay, uh, we'll take votes then. Uh, David? I'm gonna vote in favor. Okay. Of the motion. Uh, John? I'll vote yes. Thanks for your patience and helping me walk through that. Uh, Aiden? Aye. And Victoria? Aye. And Babs? Uh, <laughs> is, is that a vote? Uh, I'm going to vote aye. Thank you. That the motion to deny passes unanimously. Uh, I'd like to remind the applicant that there is a path for appeals. Uh, it has to be done within 30 days. Talk to staff for details on that. Thank and you very I much. Thank you, Kenton. And if I could also add that there is a text amendment regarding special exceptions and removing special exceptions from the zoning ordinance. However, allowing the landmark commission the ability um, to grant extra height under the standards of a certificate of appropriateness. So hopefully soon when council adopts that, you won't have, it won't be this confusing. You'll just have your certificate of appropriateness, appropriateness standards or new construction standards, et cetera. And that's what we'll be looking at. And you'll be able to have the authority to allow extra height or setbacks, changes, et cetera. Great. Thank you, Michaela. Thanks. Okay, at this point, we've been going almost two hours. Why don't we take five minutes break and then we can see if we can round up um, Robert to uh, take over again. That sound okay with you, Robert? So it's 718, let's gather at uh, 723 to get the last item. Okay, that's a deal. Thank you. Don't go too far, anybody. And 868 uh, East on 3rd Avenue. Uh, is that like L Street or M Street? Somewhere in that neighborhood along 3rd Ave. This yeah, is where the gas right. station. This is where the gas station was, isn't it? Correct. Yes. So it, we're going to turn the time over to Kate. We don't have anything in our materials, correct? In our in the Dropbox. So turn it over to Caitlin to present. This is a work session, not open to the public. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. As you said, this is a request for new construction at 860 and 868 East 3rd Avenue, where there is an existing um, gas station, which has you know, been abandoned. The applicant also owns the property to the east of the gas station site, which is 868 East. It currently has an existing detached single family home on it, which is going to remain as part of this project. So the applicant is requesting to construct six single family attached units um, in a, a townhome style development. It will be um, subdivided and sold as fee simple individual lots. This is a view of the project from 30 Avenue looking south. And this is a vicinity map of the project location. I've outlined the gas station property in yellow here. As you can see, it is at the southeast corner of the intersection of M Street and 3rd Avenue. So staff has um, recommended that the applicant come to the Landmark Commission to gather some feedback on this proposal especially with regard to the pedestrian engagement along 3rd Avenue and um, at the corner of M Street. So just to go over the project, this is a, a bird's eye view of the project looking northeast. So this longest street 
here is Third Avenue, and these are the rears of the town hall units. As you can see, they are rear loaded with uh, double car garages, and they are composed of three levels, and each of the units has a um, privately owned open area or a, a yard space, so to speak, on the roof, which can be accessed by a patch there on the roof. And um, let's see. So as you know, this is located in the Avenue's local historic district, which is very well known for having narrow lots that are very, very deep. And the majority of the homes along this street have front porches, which are quite sizable and, and are large enough for the occupants to come out and sit and entertain friends and family on those porches. So the applicant has proposed as part of their development the inclusion of these steep areas and then a ground level patio. And as you can see, as the property slopes down to the west here, there are more staircases and um, yeah, further towards the east, it's a, a simple couple steps up. And then as we move to the west, it's a, a longer staircase. But each one of those units does have a street level patio. And um, those were added uh, by the applicant in response to staff's comments that we would like to see some larger sitting areas out front, which are more typical of the Avenue's local historic district. Additionally, the end unit here has frontage along both M Street and Third Avenue. So in addition to the front porch and front street area for the westernmost unit, we have also added a small walkout area with a sunken outdoor patio, as well as this small seating area as well in an attempt to further engage the um, the corner at Spring Street and Third Avenue and to create the sense that there is still some pedestrian engagement along Ang Street, although there is no door or other type of entry on this place of the building. Again, these are just elevation drawings. Um, these are the rear of the homes, which will be accessed by the drive aisle in the back of the property. This is the westernmost unit. Again, you can see the small sitting area along M Street, and then there's the sunk in outdoor patio here. And then this is the easternmost unit, and you can see the very small street up there, and then the ground floor patio on Third Avenue. So this is um, the end of staff's short introduction. I know that the applicant is here and they can walk through the, the history part of the project and the overall changes that they've made to the design since the original submittal. And uh, again, staff just encouraged the applicant to come before the landmark commission to gather some feedback with particular attention to pedestrian engagement on M Street and Third Avenue. Hey, Caitlin Kenton here. Didn't we see this before? We did. So what's at changed? Well, at the beginning of this project, the applicant did have to go through a zoning map amendment. Um, and they introduced the project to you at that time when it was still in its, I don't want to say more, more basic design, but when it was not quite as refined as it currently is. Mm -hmm. So um, following the feedback that they received from the Landmark Commission, they again added that front, um, front patio area. They've also added um, the seating along M Street and they used to have bolt heads that they would access the rooftop garden areas with, but with the zoning change, the maximum height also changed, and those bolt heads were outside of the maximum building height allowance, and there was no provision in the ordinance that would have allowed those to stay. 
So the bullet plugs have also been removed. Additionally, they have added a little bit more mix of materials along the end street facades. They've added some wooden paneling in order to break up the sketchy blank wall. I believe that we, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, thank you. No, I pre appreciate that. So, uh, input from everybody about what's presented there. Uh, do do we does the applicant present next, or uh, what's the protocol here? Oh, that's right. This is a work session. Sorry, David. Thank you. Um, someone here to uh, present. Uh, is it? Do we have any more questions for Kaylin before we do that? Not. We'll ask the applicant to uh, to uh, present at this time. Hey everybody, um, hopefully you can hear me. Good evening. I uh, get to see everyone again. Uh, my name's Oren, um, and my partner Marcus Robinson is also on the line. We're with Remark Investments. We're the applicant as well as the property owner. Um, we also have our lead architect on the call today, um, Brian with Blaylock and Partners. Unfortunately, Kevin Blaylock um, was unable to make it, but he says hello to everybody. Um, Brian will walk us through kind of our proposal. We're uh, really excited to be here tonight. Kenton, yes, we, we have come before you guys before, but um, we thought we've made some really good progress on the design. And as Caitlin mentioned, we recently uh, received the approval from city council for the rezone of the property. Um, so we've worked with Caitlin, John, and others at planning um, to really refine uh, and bring the design to where it is today. Um, we are proud of the project. We um, hope this is a beautiful addition to the lower abs and hopefully you guys all agree and, and support. But um, yeah, just wanted to come in, get some feedback before we came back for an approval. Um, I'll pass it over to Brian at Blaylock who can go through some of our slides. Happy to answer any questions that you all may have, but um, thank you everybody and look forward to the next steps. Thank you, Oren. Thanks, Oren, appreciate that. Um, can everyone hear me? Hopefully. Yep. Um, th thank you, Caitlin. Appreciate the summary of the project. Um, I think she kind of hit all the points, um, but uh, we wanted to kind of take some time to walk you through our process a little bit and how we got from point A to point B. Um, I just want to say thanks to the commission. We appreciate your time tonight. Um, you have a lot of complex issues on your plate, so uh, that, that last agenda item is a, a fact to follow. <laughs> um, if I can, can I share my screen? My uh, share content button is grayed out. It's coming. Did it? Do you have it, Brian? Yep, now I do. All right, so just to um, remind everyone um, we did have the last time we actually had an HLC work session was back in January. Um, so we thought it would be a, uh, a good idea just to rehash what we presented there. Um, so as Caitlin mentioned, and everyone knows uh, the property at N Street and Third Ave uh, is a current gas station. Um, this is actually two parcels, a gas station uh, with a single family residence, uh, which is a, a bungalow typical of the lower Ave. Um, so we're proposing um, six new townhomes. Um, as Zorn indicated, we've, we've received approval for rezone for both of these lots to RMU 35. Um, so we're moving forward with that. Um, in the last, sorry, in the last, um, HLC work session, we just basically reviewed the general master plan of introducing six townhomes, um, working within the setbacks of RMU 35, um, and really just our desire to modulate, um, modulate those units. Uh, so we kind of introduced porches and, and break down the scale of the overall development um, and make it more conducive to the narrow lots that are predominant along this area 
Um, so this is just a slide showing some of the <clears throat> nearby uh, photos uh, from the streetscape around there, um, as well as a cross section through through Third Ave, um, showing a, a larger single family house um, to the north at the page left, and then kind of the allowable proposed building height to the right of Third Ave there. Um, so I'm going to share um, our 3D model just to walk through kind of an insight into our process. Um, show you up, show you kind of how we've we've got to the point we're at. Um, so this is just an initial diagram showing um, the buildable volume on the site. So essentially, with the RMU 35 zone, we have a 35 foot max building height. Um, so, you know, within the zoning, um, the zoning restrictions, we would really be able to, if we stepped up with the topography, um, this shows kind of the max building envelope. Um, so early on and in, in our discussions internally and with planning commission and, and all the powers that be, we, we decided to um, carve this uh, development into the ground. Um, and we we liked that because it started to reduce the scale, particularly. But Ryan, are we missing something? We're still seeing your section elevation through Third Avenue. Mm, you are definitely missing something. Okay. Let me, uh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> you see that? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, so, yeah, so just for orientation, Third Ave is here, N Street North is kind of left. Um, so, Again, this this is the uh, uh, max building envelope volume for the zoning. Um, so, you know, trying to be sensitive to the adjacent residents um, and to the adjacent neighborhood, we wanted to reduce the scale a bit and and insert this development into the ground. Um, so, as Caitlin mentioned, there's a a pretty steep fall from east to west. Um, so this actually reduces that easternmost unit to 29 feet as it uh, is adjacent to that single family residence. Um, so the next step, we actually took that scale down further um, and our design process was really um, one of subtraction um, and, and kind of carving away to uh, create individual units um, and, and make these read as individual townhomes, but also reduce scale and volume um, that was a, one of the comments from that first HLC session. So, um, so the next kind of conceptual step was introducing this idea of front porch. Um, so this started initially just as kind of a, a staircase and a, and a stoop at the entry. Um, and then introducing openings and really these are Trying to be sensitive in scale, um, but bringing in daylight and again just exercising some restraint. Um, we didn't want to. We wanted to kind of have this be a background building of, of sort. Um, <clears throat> so this is kind of a, a bigger step and a lot to unpack, but um, basically this is showing the material palette that we're exploring. Uh, so this is brick. As uh, the primary material with some wood accent uh, to provide some warmth architecturally. Um, and then there is some uh, smooth face stucco plaster that we're also looking at as well. Um, <clears throat> so we presented this particular design to the planning uh, commission. And as Caitlin uh, indicated, there was a few concerns. Uh, the main one being these stair bulkheads. We fought pretty hard to keep these in the project um, just for their, you know, the comfort and ease of accessing the rooftop, uh, the ability to bring daylight in. Um, but there isn't uh, an exception that allows for them. Um, so ultimately, we, we lowered these. Um, <clears throat> the other couple of concerns were to activate Third Avenue with, with more of a front porch. Um, then the third main concern was um, in, along N Street, trying to make this feel more like a front space, um, similar to what we have um, on Third Ave. 
Um, so to address the bulkheads, we kind of push those down, um, but we still are uh, adamant about having access to the roof. Um, so that's more of a skylight that still provides daylight uh, with a roof hatch and then a mechanical screen wall for uh, mechanical equipment on the roof. Um, then going down to a street view. Uh, so like I said, initially these front porches were conceived as, as kind of a, you know, a stairway with a stoop or a porch at the front entry. Um, but, you know, in our talks with Planning Commission, um, they wondered if we can make those a bit grander um, and really start to activate the uh, sidewalk. Um, so we introduced these these wooden decks that kind of play off the material palette, um, but also provide um, seating area along the sidewalk along Third Ave. And these really get larger and larger um, as we go up in grade and we reduce the size of the staircase. Um, so the, I think the second biggest move or probably the largest move we, we made and biggest um, revision was starting to try to wrap the uh, aesthetic along Third Ave onto End Street and to make this feel more like a front facade. Um, we have kind of two front faces. Um, so we've also, as Caitlin indicated, we've carved in a, a terrace area um, as well as kind of an at grade area. And one thing to um, correct is we actually are anticipating a doorway access onto this area. Um, it's just not at grade. It's down at that kind of sunken basement level. Um, when we thought through, you know, whether to put it, put a doorway into the garage area, um, this space actually in this corner is kind of a flex space, office, slash potential bedroom. We just thought this would be used more. Um, so we are, are anticipating that. Um, then just another look at previous West facade and the updated version. That's, that's kind of just a look into our process. Um, we're happy to hear whatever input the commission has um, and look forward to keep, keeping this process rolling. Thank you. Commissioners, this is a work session. Uh, let's uh, give the applicant any feedback that uh, people want to give them. That's what we're here for. Yeah, the, well, thanks, Robert. I'll start out. The first thing I'd like to say is I really appreciate that thoughtful walk through the design process and the way you came to this solution. Boy, I th really wish we'd had something like this on that Thistle Out project we saw last month. Uh, this is really, really helpful to see your rationale. And, and uh, I, uh, I don't have anything to say to change this. I think it's going to be a great project there. I lived across the street for a couple of years when I was right out of college. And uh, it would have been a delight to look out on something like this. So I think that it's well done. I, I join you in ruining the loss of your bulkheads because accessing a roof deck through a through a hatch is not going to be all that uh, appealing. But you know that's I guess that's where you're stuck. But other than that, I say this looks good. I don't have changes. I'd suggest to this. I think you've done a fine job. Well, I've got my microphone off, Kent, and I'll, I'll move into. Uh, and, and I agree, it's a it's a very nice design. Um, I think if I were a neighbor to this project, um, I would certainly be concerned with the height and the volume. Um, and particularly if I were the neighbor to the east, but interestingly, um, the neighbor to the east is part of this property, so. Um, they're not going to complain. Um, I would like to talk about the roof decks, which I think are a great idea. I'm, you know, Corbu got it right 100 years ago, and it's still a great idea. 
And the Landmarks Commission may have the ability to um, allow increased height for those bulkheads. I, that may be something to chat with staff about. But I would add a concern that in particular that east bulkhead would make what I call the Bambi meets Godzilla 28 foot facade to that historic home even worse. So, I mean, there are opportunities to pair bulkheads, I'm sure um, that, that would involve architecturally considering how the entrances work and how the stairway, the vertical circulation works. Um, I would like to end with one uh, primary concern, and that is, is that I think that these front steps and decks are completely apologetic. And um, there's just tremendous room for improvement there. Um, to me, it's a place for Amazon to leave a package, but uh, no human being is actually going to sit there and engage with their their neighbors as they walk by. I mean, we all understand the separation between uh, public space and private space and how those layers of space work architecturally. And, and, and to me, this is just a, an apologetic solution. And, and, and um, you guys are great architects. You can come up with something better, so. And I've seen, I might add that I've represented um, some developers on projects just like this. And um, I, although I didn't represent the one on uh, what is it, Ninth East and 17th South, where they have little patios out front, you see stuff out there, but you never see anyone sitting there because the traffic noise is kind of crazy. Uh, the one that I've seen more successful is a bit of a half wall where you're protected from that street and from passersby, you know, kicking over your table or what have you. And I agree that that could be worked on a little bit and not just with landscaping and throwing in a few grassy um, vegetation. Um, looks good when it grows up, but still need a little improvement on that. And we love, love, love um, rooftop um, balconies or, or patios. Um, and what I might suggest is one of the number one things people ask me is, can I have a hot tub? So make sure you put some extra strength up there so people can have a hot tub up there. <laughs> uh, Dave, David and Babs, good observations on those seating areas. I'm glad you picked that up because uh, as I look at them now, I think you're right. That that one to the uh, the west facade actually would be a more appealing spot because you have a little bit of definition of your personal space. Yeah, and if we think about a traditional porch in in a walkable neighborhood like the avenues, um, the the way the the porch relates to the street and the neighborhood, and um, as a as a semi-private space is very, very, very important. Yeah, there needs to be a definition of where the public realm ends and yours begins, but you need to be able to reach across them figuratively to make contact with your neighbors and not feel like they're stepping into your house. Right, and where there's such a harsh um, facade here where we're looking at uh, 28 to 35 feet of height, just a few feet from the sidewalk. Um, uh, to mitigate that with a, with a truly functioning porch feature, and I don't mean a deck at, at the sidewalk level, I mean a truly functioning porch where people sit there and, um, and can communicate with people walking by, uh, I think would, would be tremendously successful here. And, and, and I fully recognize it'll take away from the indoor square footage but it's important outdoor square footage. What does what does zoning say? What if there was a small uh, balcony that came off of that main living area? Would that would that intrude into the setback, or is it considered somehow different? Like the stairs can come out into that space. So just enough deck cantilevering out to allow two comfortable chairs and a table or a type four. 
That's a really great question, Quentin. Thank you. Um, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but stairways are permitted to encroach into the setback to a certain degree. And again, I don't know what that maximum limitation is, but I can look that up. I think once a deck gets more than two feet off the ground, it has to meet setback requirements. Yeah, um, that's a, that may be true. Oh, sorry, as well. Stair, stairways and, and, and landings that go into a building can be up to four feet in the yard area, up to four feet high. Uh -huh. Thanks, Wayne. So. But, the, but the concept of defining a space that will allow public interaction with, with your, your, your personal limits I think is a very good point that David and Babs remarked on. And again, as David said, you guys are good architects. Uh, I think you can probably take that concept and develop it within the context of the approach you've taken so far. I agree. And thank you for scrolling around the model. That's quite helpful as we talk. I appreciate that. Can you keep orbiting around to the south facade a little? That's what I want to talk about. I think I, I agree with everyone else. The, the other, the primary facades are great. They're, I, I think the materials are well considered and articulated in a in a nice refined way i i get a little bit worried about um large expanses of stucco because they never seem to be executed quite as well as we would hope they would like in a you know a sketch up model where they're actually flat um and especially when a lot of times in, in my experience on on multi-family housing projects like you know, stuff like venting the um, the dryers comes into play, and then they just kind of get scatter shot placed on that that rear facade, and um, you know that combined with with some plaster execution issues, it can like get ugly fast. Um, like a turning point in a football game or something, it can just kind of spiral from there. In my mind. Um, so I do like that there's these these porches here. I think those are great. Um, and, you know, I like the style of garage door with the, with the lights in it. Um, I, I do just worry about the flat, the intended flat plaster. I don't know if other commissioners have experience in that, uh, in the context of the historic landmark commission, but we, we just don't have the, the craftspeople that we used to. Yeah, you bring up a good point there, and, and there's going to have to be control joints, so maybe they can be celebrated with color or a slight change in um, push pull or what have you. Yeah, and I think it norm. I wouldn't be as worried about it in like a normal side yard condition, but since this is so close to the corner, I'm just in street view right now. Like, and the the house to the south, that fourplex or whatever it is is set back pretty far. It looks like it's got about a 30 foot front yard. So you're going <laughs> to, as you drive up N street, you're going to really see that. That's going to be like your primary experience of this building. If you're going north through the avenues. Yeah. You know, to your point, John, that corner unit is special. Yeah. Maybe it's, maybe it's just doing something with that, that part of the facade. It just feels like that corner could could kind of turn on you. <clears throat> yeah, is there some opportunity to do some subtle break or plane differentiation on that south wall. It doesn't need to be the to the extent you've done it on the north 
facade. But maybe maybe where each unit transition from unit to unit is there just some in, inset or, or or something to uh, I guess you you tried to do that with the with the uh, wood wood insets with the with the window. Uh, Again, without without coming up with a solution, I'd say um, I'd encourage you to consider this this facade as well in light of what John <coughs> has pointed out. Well, yeah, I think that wood kind of slivers are a good move. It really helps break it up. Um, and I know we don't, or I've heard it said we don't really consider stuff like stucco score joints because that's more of a kind of constructability detail, but um, maybe just kind of laying those out a little bit in the drawings would help. Yeah. And are they, those uh, wood insets and windows really different sizes? Or is that the, just the modeling at this point? Those are meant to be the same. Yeah, yeah. apologize, that's a modeling error. <laughs> Yeah, my SketchUp models are always perfect, of course, but I can understand how that would happen. <laughs> no, not really. I'd, I'd have the same thing show up, so. Yeah, yeah no. Zoning would allow it, but to push and pull each unit a little bit to different, differentiate each unit slightly might be helpful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think particularly, this great feedback, particularly this westernmost unit seems like that's the most it's, prominent it's, visual. Yeah, it's special they, they'd be that much more valuable too huh? you, you know you added on another 40 square feet or something like that how much more could you up the cost the price <laughs> yeah yeah we're we're basically right at setback uh -huh. um, with this upper floor so we would need some sort of variance or eat away at the other unit i yeah. guess to start yeah. to do that you probably already said that. Is that cast cast concrete right there on the yeah. lower level? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another thing where I think the execution is going to be very important. But yeah. Just my yeah. two cents. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's all, they're all great points and uh, dryer vents are the bane of our existence. <laughs> so. Well, thinking of that, what about heating, cooling or You've got all your units internalized. I guess you had a condensing unit up on the roof, didn't you? Uh, in by the, the hatch slash bulkhead. Yeah, I think the general thought was um, uh, just a furnace closet for each and then a condensing unit up on the roof. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, we'll look, we've, we've really gone back and forth on the porches and, you know, ultimately these row house typologies, you know, these are a little over 20 feet wall to wall from kind of the brick to the wood for each unit. So, you know, it, it just, it makes for, it's already kind of a tough layout. Um, but, you know, we'd have to eat into kind of this kitchen dining area to introduce a larger porch. Up, up at that door level. Well, well, unfortunately, there is very little row house typology in this neighborhood, if any at all. Mm -hmm. And you really give up uh, on the roof by putting the condensers up there. And what I'm seeing in more and more projects that they're using the European heating and cooling units that go um, on the uh, almost to the ceiling on your upper walls. Yeah, like a mini split kind of. Mm -hmm. There, are, you see them in Mexico. You see them in Europe. They're just like a long white box mm -hmm. almost, and they're highly efficient. And they're about five thousand bucks a piece. And you put them, I don't know, three and three or four of them in there, and then you don't have to do the venting, and you don't have the condenser. But that's just, the options, there's still a condenser outside. Yeah, those right. split. It has to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. 
We just don't mm -hmm. notice that we're, we're in a cool hotel room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're just—they're not those big things. But anyway, that has nothing to do with this design. I think we should move on. This is great. Aiden, Any comments. Aiden's trying to talk, but you're muted, <laughs> or your audio is not working. No, still can't. Now you're unmuted. Aiden, Aiden do you have a comment? <laughs> hmm. Anyone other commissioners have a comment? If not, we'll thank the uh, applicants for being here tonight and uh, look forward to uh, receiving a, uh, a plan for action. Uh, by the commission. Thank you. Appreciate your time tonight. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate the Thanks time. Coming. We'll, we'll okay. be back soon. See you Thanks. soon. Thanks. Any other business before we close, commissioners or, or city staff? No, sir. All right. Let's go home and we'll see everyone in October. Good night. Hey. Bye. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Michaela.